Guys, what is going on? This is Dave Tilly, uh, Shift World out there, podcast world, however you're hearing this. Um, we have an epic episode coming up for you today. So I'm here with Kiefer Lamy, one of my very good buddies and also our director of strength conditioning here at Champion. And we're gonna answer uh, an entire like kind of conversation on probably the most common question I think I get. Next to maybe injuries and flexibility, very, very confusing is the world of like gymnastic strength and conditioning. So physical preparation is what it's called in the gymnastics world, strength and conditioning in our world. But I get a lot of people who have a lot of confusion around what to do, how do I plan for this, what exercises do I do, should I only do gymnastic stuff, should I not do strength sure. and conditioning? It's like, a, it's a nightmare, right? And kind of just setting a background to this is the biggest, the internet is a blessing and a curse, man. It's there's so much stuff out there that is available, but when you scroll through feeds and stuff, and you're like, ooh, I like that exercise, you're like, where do I put it in? Right. How do I fit this? Is it good for my kids? Is this gonna hurt somebody? So um, what are your thoughts on just the overview of what we're gonna talk about before we gotta dive into it? I think I think the biggest thing overall is being able to kind of simplify things, mm -hmm. chunk it into its pieces, yep. and then create a game plan ahead of time so that you're not just one day picking an exercise from the internet and being like, all right, today I'm gonna do this with yeah. my kids, right? Yeah. If you have an understanding of what your phases are and how much time you have for an adaptation, right. Right. it's right. much easier to pick and choose what you're doing when and to not like get worried. They're like, oh, my kids are falling behind because Correct. I haven't done more. Correct, absolutely. And uh, people who are watching this, uh, I've already posted another amazing lecture that Kiefer gave to our strength conditioning interns, which was more around how we build programs for like the, the performance side of what we do here at Champion. So we are lucky that we've run a program now for four years mm -hmm. that uh, college and JO athletes come to us, they work out once or twice per week. And it's, it's very good because you should get in a strength conditioning facility, but we want to kind of tackle what do you do with the other maybe four days in your program sure. or three days in your program in the gym, which is kind of more my world, but Kiefer's also getting involved as well. Um, um, that's what we're going to try to talk about is we're going to start kind of global on these concepts, break it down to then like, okay, what are the steps to build these programs? And then we'll finish up with some specifics about sets and reps and things like that. I think it's a good way to conceptualize it. What we want to make sure we don't do is go too finite and give you like specific examples of like exactly what I'm going to do because everybody's different, different gym, different equipment, different athletes, different strength coaches, different staff. So what we're trying to do is give you more the principles and recommendations of how you build these things so you can have a conversation with local strength strength coaches or your gym and figure out what works best for you in the, another podcast we might go really in depth with just me talking about you know how I program but I think it's better if we start global and let people kind of chew on all the pieces sure all right, all right so first off what are we looking at here what's the first thing to discuss so we kind of roughly laid out uh, how you can chunk up an off season here right so if we've got an off season we know Dave was telling me we have you know somewhere around three three and a half months to work with yep. right so from May JO Nationals, the end, Elite Nationals, whatever is in the summer, obviously, but May is most people's season, and then that you have, you know, June, July, August, September's preseason again. So it's really the summer for people here in the States. It's a little bit different people across the world in Australia and the UK, but three months. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So what we did, starting from right after the season ends, we've got this first period we call it like a postseason period, right? So this could be, you know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever it is. Your primary goals during this time is is like recovery, getting healthy, yep. right? And starting to plan for the next season. Yep. So you give people some time off, right? Maybe you give them some general mobility work. They're doing some soft tissue work, whatever like recovery modalities you like sure. to use, sure. right? And then I think one of the biggest things is you're starting to assess. Not only assess the kids and see like, all right, what, what are the individual needs from mm -hmm. a performance perspective? Mm -hmm. What are the individual needs from a movement perspective? Yep. But then also assess more globally, like, all right, like what does our program need to work totally. on? What do I value as far as how strong our kids should be, how in shape they should be, mm -hmm. how powerful they should be, Absolutely. right? So you're able to figure out not just like, all right, how do I individualize for this kid, but then how do I take the program where I want it to be come right. next season, right? Right. So during this phase, you know, recovery is our primary thing, assessment, and then just general movement stuff because you don't want the kids taking an entire two or three week period off yeah. doing nothing, watching yeah. Netflix, because exactly. then when they do get back into the gym, they're gonna be sore and it's gonna yeah. feel like crap. Yeah, and this is a very big uh, controversial point in gymnastics world is, you know, I think the pendulum has swung really far. It's a year-round season, which, or a year-round training schedule, which is brutal on a sport, right? And, and I think that when I first came out with some of my friends of mine, we were like, we need a relative deload, right? What we're not saying is hide for a month right. and don't do anything. That's right. not at all what we're saying, right? There's plenty, I do think like a week or two weeks, you can chill, chill pretty well, at least one week, but there's two weeks probably after that where you're, again, you're screening, you're working with people, you're doing basics, flexibility, trampoline, like kind of getting the rust out, so to to speak, sure. um, which speaks to a really important point that I think is overlooked here is not only do we want a little bit of a deload period, but you also can't come in on Monday, practice one, day one, and be like, all right, 
we're gonna like we're gonna crush it. And you go, right. you do three full events, you do a full strength program that's new, and a cardio circuit, and your kids are crushed, right? So it's all about slowly ramping up and ramping down. Give them some time, but then kind of ease into that first little block. Sure. So we're thinking about these three things. This is probably a couple weeks. So now as we get into early June and we transition, what are we thinking about in our middle chunk? So middle chunk we called like early off season. Right? So if you take your whole off season period to break it in half, this first part is about building that foundation and being able to build momentum towards the more specific things you want to do. Okay. Right? So at this phase, maybe we're saying somewhere around 50-50 um, percentages of like gymnastics work yep. and strength conditioning work. Yep. Yep. And at this point, we're pretty much drawing a line in the sand and separating them. Yep. Right? We're not trying to do specific movements. We're not trying to like integrate strength conditioning with their gymnastics workout. Gotcha. What we're trying to do is lay a super basic foundation of movements with you know full body lifts, working on hinge movement, squat movement, single leg stuff, push, pull, core work in all three directions, yeah. right? Which we'll talk a little bit more about. Yeah. Um, and just lay that foundation, starting super basic, building up to a point where they have some general fitness, right? While you're doing this, you're probably helping improve the way they move, improving yeah. you know general strength, improving like how their joints feel, how they're yeah, doing yeah, all this yeah. stuff, right? So that you can do more specific stuff and you can tolerate more as they get later on. Totally, yeah. And so again, on the on the fifty percent on the, kind of the gymnastics side, which is obviously what I'm more well known for, is this is where you're thinking about your like bread and butter gymnastics stuff. So Nick Ruddick has a really good kind of octagon model where he talks about these things. He has like a daily dozen where he thinks that all gymnasts should do a couple of really important exercises, right? And so for us, we're thinking about in these other 50 days, we're getting in our cast handstands, we're getting in rope climbs, we're getting in gymnastic shapes, we're getting in you know press handstands, men's ring strength or women's hip strength, stuff like that. We're not saying don't do gymnastics specific training. That's not what we're saying in this very like new school hybrid approach to gymnastics training. What we're saying is you have to have a balance of both, especially in the off season, because this is how we build a general robust athlete that we can then funnel into very gymnastics specific adaptations. Do you agree? I think that's perfect. For yeah, sure. and I think I I think that's kind of what we're talking about here is just the same way as you have these like must have gymnastics movements that you're yep. doing in your workout. From a strength and conditioning perspective, we have these like must have right. strength and conditioning right. movements where like you're not going to be able to optimize the way you perform in any sport yes. if you don't really have that foundation of basic movements first. Completely, completely agree. So, and back onto this point, the strength training twice a week. So for people who are really looking for like a tactical way to approach this, here's my suggestion. So in our gym personally, we're lucky, obviously it's biased. I'm there, I'm a strength coach, people are there. We also have a facility where we can lift inside of our you know, sure. larger facility, completely not what people have, but we do f uh, five days of strength and conditioning in the summer, two uh, heavy days, two medium days, and one light day. And then two of those days, like one of the heavy and medium days, we're in our gymnastics gym, we're doing this kind of stuff, but we're doing with gymnastics, ropes, and high bar stuff, whatever. Two of those other days, we go upstairs, dumbbells, barbells, kettlebells, that sure. kind of stuff. And then we have one day, which is a light day, more of a recovery day, which is flexibility, um, soft tissue care, prehab, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. if you have five days in the gym and that's what you have to work with, I would suggest that. If you don't have that and you're maybe only in gym three days a week, maybe just do one day of strength conditioning and one day of mixed kind of gymnastics yep. base and contract the strength coach to come in and help you with some of that stuff. They can buy five kettlebells and five dumbbells would be the best thing you ever did in your life in med balls. But if you're on the lower end, one day maybe. If you're on the super high end, we work with a lot of college programs work with a lot of elite athletes, they're doing two days, right? Sure. So they have much more flexibility to work with there. Bump it up a little bit more, but don't just think like you're gonna approach the week and roll as you go. You're like, oh, we'll try this today, we'll try that today. You have to really take a step back and plan these things in advance or it's a nightmare for a coach. Sure. And then I think the other thing that we didn't necessarily write up here is during this phase, like our intensity is still relatively low, yeah. right? You're working, you know, 50 to 70% intensity, which yep. for a lot of kids is totally tolerable, yep. right? They're not necessarily going to failure, yep. right? And we do things like we put things in triplets, right? So you're mm -hmm. moving through three exercises all at once with kind of minimal rest. So you're also starting to build an aerobic base, Correct. right? You might be doing GPP circuits at the end, which you know we can give some examples of. Yep. But you might be setting the clock for 10 minutes and you've got five exercises lined up, all different varieties, yep. right? And you're just trying to get continuous movement, right? So their yep. heart rate's a little bit elevated. Totally. They're building their fitness so that when you get to the point of doing more skills and routines and stuff, they actually have that foundation. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I was going to say this at the end, but I think it's, it just fits really well here. There are two ways to approach this. Personally, for me, I think that a binder approach with coach coach writing program athletes follow their papers is really really good but sometimes people work with younger athletes it's like herding cats trying to get it do a do a circuit setup do sure. five stations time it on the clock one minute of work get your reps done move to the next one mm -hmm. set cones up if you're stuffed in a small little spe uh, space in the gym and you don't have this giant elaborate setup just just make the circuit work within your you know little tiny network it's totally. completely fine to do that there's no right way to do this as long as you're you're on the same kind of path of what you're looking for so to speak. and then and maybe we'll outline some strategies for that because totally. I think that on a minute idea and doing circuits is a really great idea yep. and just having an idea 
idea of like what's a good work to rest and then being able to set the yeah. clock and just let them go. Totally, I agree. Yeah. Okay, cool. So then, so say we get through the meat and the potatoes of our middle uh, off season and we'll, we'll go through this next for sets and reps and all that kind of example, but what's the last little transition point of getting back to school August stuff? Sure, late off season, um, we're starting to get more specific. Right? Yeah. So at this point, your strength and conditioning workouts might be integrating more specific gymnastic skills into them, yeah. which is awesome, yeah. right? Yeah. And then we're starting to increase the intensity, yeah. meaning loading's going up a little bit, reps are going down a little bit, right? So instead of maybe two to three sets of 10 to 12 building very general strength, yeah. maybe we're doing three, four, potentially five, depending on how high level they are, yeah. of you know three to eight reps, right? Yeah. And we're trying to be like more crisp with the movement, a little more explosive with all of it. And at the same time, we're starting to add these like power development movements that you might look like they have more carryover to gymnastics, right? Totally. So we're doing some jumps, right? We're doing some med ball stuff, which you know we may be doing early on, but the intent is a little bit different. Yeah, it's learning. Early on, you're learning, you're working on landing mechanics, you're starting to build ground contacts. Later on, you're like, all right, let's get after yeah, this. For you're, sure, tr yep. you're trying to get as much as you yep. can out of every single rep. Put the music up, get after exactly. it. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. And so two things I wanna share on this that I think people uh, need to understand. So one is that, one of the reasons I've always enjoyed working with Kiefer, as opposed to many other strength coaches that I work with, is every strength coach I try to work with is trying to replace what gymnasts are doing. They're trying to be like, nope, you're wrong, you're doing it. And they're trying to scrap a program and they're trying to like kind of be the person who's writing it. That's not what we're looking for. We're trying to add accessory pieces, components to make the athlete better, right? So what we're doing here, and especially in the end of the summer, is we're trying to still get to the end goal of explosive body weight gymnastic skills. That's sure. what we want, right? And so everything we're doing here is not just because we want to throw exercises at people. It's because the goal, as we'll say, as we move into the off season and pass that, is to get back to skills and routines and do well at meets. That's what we want to happen. We're not just trying to do random mm -hmm. stuff to try to find it. And I think that what's going to be here is you can make this analogy to how we learn skills, right? In the beginning of the off season, you do some like drills and basics, but as kids start putting their routines together and learning skills, they're gonna to wanna to put that power into what they're learning. And just in the end of August, September, we're gonna start be doing more skill combinations. We're gonna start be doing explosive power work for some of our strength conditioning stuff. Sure. It's gonna move you towards the end goal of a better routine. So like keep that in the back of your mind is that what we're doing is setting the foundation. You only have three months to get strong, right? That's the most time that we can get strong and get really powerful is in this big chunk. Right. You're not gonna get stronger in the middle of the season when you're doing meets. It's right. just not gonna happen. So this right. is really you gotta focus on. What we try to explain, right, is that your goal as a strength and conditioning coach is to build the qualities that you need to excel at your sport. Got it, great. Right? Like so that. as we go through all of this, we're talking about like, all right, let's recover and let's be like a fresh athlete first, yep. right? Yep. And our first qualities that we're trying to look at is like your, your movement quality, right? How well totally. can you do these things because nothing else is gonna matter if you move like crap and you get injured because of it yeah. or whatever, yeah. right? After that, we're building you know general strength, general aerobic system. And then after that, we're trying to get to the point of utilizing that to build more explosive power. Totally. Right? And when we get to that point, we've kind of accomplished our goal of like, all right, your kids are fit, your kids are a little more explosive than last year, here you go, you can hopefully excel more at the stuff that you really want to do. Yeah. Right? I'm yeah. not trying to make somebody great in the weight room, I'm just trying yeah. to give them the Absolutely. tools they need to excel at gymnastics. And other common myth, this is not a one rep max front squat. Right. We're not, you're not going to see traditional, you know, people get misconceptions, they think gymnastics and weightlifting, they think heavy, heavy front squats, they think like meathead bicep stuff. Not really what we're looking for here. Rarely do we ever put somebody over what, like a, a five-ish, five to eight rep yeah. range that we're working yeah. with. So you're not gonna get this. There's so much research that debunks the myths that people have that they're gonna just get really bulky and they're gonna get, you know, have issues related to flexibility. They're gonna get hurt. It's just completely um, misunderstood. And all those things can be dispelled if you just look around and use the right strength program. Sure. Um, cool with this? Yeah. Okay, so we kind of just covered the overview, the kind of big kind of uh, meta level thinking in the clouds, but now we want to get a little bit more into the trenches about how we're going to actually program these things. So um, the first thing that I want to kind of just drive home is, is really going back to the first point about, you know, why are we even doing this in the first place? Why should gymnastics care? Why don't we just keep doing body weight movements for the rest of time and see how it goes? And I think a lot of people, when I speak and lecture, they really think that this helps them. Okay, so the basic, the basic equation for what we want in gymnastics, power, we want explosive power, is a production of force over time, okay? So don't worry about the math on it or anything. It's not that big of a deal. But to get more power, you need to either, <laughs> you need to either increase force or you need to reduce the amount of time you express that force, okay? So on the force category, there's two ways you can do this. So one is that you increase cross-sectional area of muscles mm -hmm. or you get stronger, right? The way you do that is through a strength base. That's what we're trying to establish is you're trying to lay the foundation to have more strength available to eventually have that become power exercises or put more force into the equipment or on the ground, things like that. Okay, the other way that we do this is we optimize gymnastics technique, right? It's, it's kind of common knowledge, but not really thought about is 
If you have better technique, you don't leak as much energy when you're doing tumbling or when you're swinging really hard, you're gonna have more force to express through the equipment, right? Or more force to express through the ground. So these two things on top are trying to increase the amount of force you can produce to get an athlete to jump higher or run faster or whatever. Okay, on the other side, you can reduce the time put into the uh, actual force through the floor or whatever by doing two things. You can train specifically for power exercises, which w it becomes the August, September preseason transition is really focusing on intent, like Kiefer said. Or again, we optimize technique, right? If you can whip faster and you understand snap down more, or you know how to throw your arms faster, that's gonna increase the amount of power because you're manipulating the time equation. So the reason I say this is not to just overwhelm people, but to understand like this is why I personally feel that the entire culture and concept in gymnastic strength training has to change because we're leaving out huge opportunity on the table to make athletes more uh, powerful and stronger, but also these are the same things that reduce injury, right? Injuries happen because the loading is here and your capacity is here. And whether you do one bad turn and you blow your ACL out or you chip away at a meniscus issue slowly but surely, the same thing that's gonna make you stronger and faster is also probably gonna keep you healthier throughout the year. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's, let's work through this. All right. Um, I think kind of just piggybacking off of this, like a way that I was always taught this that makes a ton of sense to me, right, is that sports happen on like this continuum from, you know, one end being absolute speed, yep. right, the other end being absolute strength. Correct. Right. And almost all of our sports are spent entirely on the absolute speed end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. right? They're body weight only, right? They're explosive. You're trying to do things quickly. You know, if you're a basketball player, you're sprinting and you're jumping. If you're right. a gymnast, you're doing your skill work and you're jumping and you're sprinting, yep. right? and nothing happens on this other end of the spectrum. Mm. So what happens is we try to practice more and more and more and we're just building volume of the exact same thing. So it's right. more ground contact, more right. beating into the ground with all this stuff, right? Yep. If we can take advantage of the other end of the spectrum, then we're able to kind of like make their glass, their their foundation or their ability to kind of like perform bigger, mm -hmm. right? And then we might get more out of that skill work. Correct. So we start all the way on the other end of the spectrum doing, you know, the strength work. Yep. And then you get more out of, you know, weighted jumps or jumping drills that help you get better at your skills. Right. So you work your way back towards this. Right. Because you're always going to do your practice and your skill work. Correct. Right? But we're not always going to do these things. So we have to find a time to be able to work on it. Absolutely. And I think the good analogy I also use people like is there's, there's many ways to get better at gymnastics without doing gymnastics, right? Right. And so the example that we think about in the gymnastics world is like, you don't always have to do Tkachevs or your Trancos to just really get better. You can do drills, you can increase your shoulder flexibility so you have more action against the table. You can, again, there's a lot of different ways that you can optimize the athlete, especially in a sport like gymnastics that is just such high force. Like the pounding is incredible. The sport has gotten so much harder. Young kids growing through puberty, especially in the 10 to 14, that's where the most issues happen for kids who get hurt and just accumulate snowball injuries. If we can find ways to get them stronger and move towards the goals of harder skills, but maybe just back burner those things temporarily until they go mm -hmm. through puberty and they're healthier, right? We're going to really get them in a good position to succeed from 14 to 24, 29. Who knows where they can go after that? But sure. we got to do a better job of taking care of them when they're younger. All right, so let's get into this is program design stuff we're going to talk about now. So basic program program design, and we're we're kind of talking at least for right now about like that early off season phase where we're separating the strength work from yep. your gymnastics work a little bit, right? Yep. So it's more general movements. Yep. So what we did on the left is we kind of outlined our movement patterns that we're trying to work on. So hinge, this is people think of it as like your deadlift movement, squat pattern, single leg stuff, right? And there's a couple different ways we can do that. Mm -hmm. um, pushing pulling both upper body and then 3D core rewrite. So this is not necessarily creating shapes, but it's almost like avoiding shapes, right? right so it's exactly. anti-extension, mm -hmm. uh, anti-rotation, anti-lateral flexion stuff. The stuff that as you get into the season, you do more specific things that you lose sight of because you're always worried about, yeah. you know, being arched or being hollow, not Correct. necessarily finding neutral. Yep, right? absolutely. And then what we're doing here is we're, this is gonna be the two days of you, if you remember from the first little chunk here, is that two, these are the two days of the actual strength in the gym yeah. kind of stuff, the fitness gym. So there are two other full days that might be gymnastic specific stuff, mm -hmm. but we also want to outline, remember, this could just be a one day longer program for someone who's in the gym three days. You got to play with what you need, but what you'll see is there's two days of fitness stuff and then we'll use these later, but this is more blue marker stuff is more like gymnastic specific essentials, cast handstands, stuff, things like that. Again, things from Nick Ruddick's Daily Dozen that I've got, learned a lot of, but we're gonna go with that later after Kiefer kind of breaks this down and I'm gonna show you how it, it's together more than apart. So uh, as we start here, we kind of spread things across two days, right? And what you'll see is that we've got them categorized by a little grouping. So A group, B group, and then C group, 
right? And we talked a little bit before about how like we like using triplets, mm. um, particularly for you know younger gymnasts or yep. ones that don't have as much of a training age. Yeah. Because or the triplet, attention span. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it does a good job of being able to corral a whole team, mm -hmm. right? So you can have stations where kids can go to. Yeah. Um, but also because we're working at a relatively lower intensity, you don't need a ton of rest. And by doing something like a triplet, or honestly even doing four exercises in a row, yep. you can treat it more like a circuit, and you can get a decent general aerobic base at the same time. Correct. Right. Yep. And I think that, again, this is the only thing that I found successful. We only have 30 to 45 minutes sometimes for our yep. strength conditioning circuit and trying to do all of one and move to the next, it's impossible. Right. right? So when you're thinking about how you're going to get this in your, in your gym, this is probably your best bet for mm -hmm. density wise, but also how do you get all these exercises in a week? Yep. Yep. So uh, we break it up. Uh, we generally, what we do is we prioritize a bilateral lower body movement first, right? So I build the days essentially based off of this. So day one is our deadlift day. So kettlebell deadlift here would be an example of what Dave can do with his gym and the kettlebells he yep. has. Yep. And day two is a squat day, right? Based off of that, we just build everything out, trying to find balance between the movements. So we hit a variety of, or we hit all the movements throughout the week, yep. right? So on day one, we're trying to get a horizontal pushing exercise and a horizontal pulling exercise. So an example here would be like a push-up variation yep. and a horizontal row, which you might be able to do like feet elevated, inverted row yep. somewhere in the gym, yep. right? We're gonna add in a single leg exercise that complements the deadlift. So a deadlift is a more hip dominant exercise. So we're gonna use a split squat, which is like a little bit more knee quad dominant yep. exercise, yep. right? And then we're putting in some core work. So a core work in each triplet, this could be you know, an anti-extension drill, so maybe something like a plank variation, yep. like plank drag through yep. or whatever. Um, and then here we might add like an anti-lateral flexion or anti-rotation exercise. So maybe you're doing side planks, you're mm -hmm. doing, if you have access to bands, an anti-rotation press or something. Yep, for sure. Right? And then at the end, what we tend to add in, is if you have time for this, I think it's super important just for keeping them healthy, is just some general accessory work for building hip strength and building shoulder strength because mm. they take a beating. Correct, yep. Right? And then second day of the week, we're just building off of this the exact same sort of template, but instead of a horizontal pushing exercise, we do an overhead pressing exercise, right? Instead of a horizontal row, you're doing a vertical pulling exercise. So maybe this is like a pull up or a regression of that for yep, your athletes. Rope climb. And then same idea with the core here, but maybe you're just picking different variations. So whatever yep. fits, you know, your age group and or you know the exercises that you're familiar coaching. Yep. It doesn't really matter as long as you're staying within the category. So, yeah, movements. there's a, a thousand really good ones. Right. Yep. And then hitting the accessory work again because once a week probably isn't enough and they can definitely handle it two or three yeah. times a week without Lower being intensity. sore from that. Yeah. yeah. And again, going back to the doublets and the triplets is that the way this actually becomes programmed is like somebody would come in the gym, they would do whatever, five to eight reps of their kettlebell deadlift. They would move on to their push up. They would do their core exercise and then they would go back through and start mm -hmm. back down again. So it's not like they're doing a three by eight deadlift and then a three by whatever push up and then the core stuff. Again, they keep moving. And I think the benefit is like Kiefer said, attention span, space, circuitry, but also you're giving these muscle groups a little bit of a recovery yeah. to kind of kind of get back in shape for the next thing, right? If you do eight deadlifts, then you wait 30 seconds to do eight deadlifts again, you definitely can't express as much force as right. before. So by shaking out some of the, you know, the fatigue through these other two, you're probably going to get the most high quality, best effort out of the kids each rep. Mm -hmm. And then what we did up here is just briefly outlined what things might look like. And this could change a ton. It changes based on, you know, your athletes, how old they are, how much time they spend in the gym in the past, right? But early off season, you're maybe looking at something like two to three sets of eight to 15 reps yep. in general, yep. right? And you can kind of chunk this as like the heavier bilateral exercises like your deadlift and your squat might be on the lower end of the rep spectrum. Your stuff later in the workout might be at the higher end of the rep spectrum. So, you know, first two weeks, you might be coming in and being like, all right, 30 minute lift, we're gonna hit two rounds of each of these groupings, you know, um, eight to 12 reps based on, you know, you can pick out athletes and what they're capable of, yep. right? Or maybe something like these inverted rows, like some kids are capable of eight, some kids are capable of 15 totally, before yep. they fatigue, yep. right? Because your idea is it's this lower intensity, slightly higher volume, trying to build kind of strength endurance, build their movement patterns. Yep, absolutely. And I think too, on that backbone is uh, the eight to 12 reps is also really good for that athlete within one set, right? If you yeah. We say like, okay, I want two, but I want to go eight to 12. If you get to eight and you are dying and the quality's falling apart and it looks like you're worming your way up, just stop with your eight and then move it on. But if you get to eight and it seems like the weight wasn't as challenging as you thought, knock out mm -hmm. four more reps. And Perfect. you know, again, you're trying to give someone a bandwidth because you don't want to stuff kids in a box where they have to do three by 10 and it looks awful. You know, yeah. that's not at all what we're trying to do for. So I think the eight to 12 rep range or eight to 15 is good in the research for strength and hypertrophy mm -hmm. stuff, but it also gives a little bit of a wiggle room for kids that are maybe new or don't understand it and stuff like that. And, and you figure this stuff out pretty fast, right? Like a lot of your kids will probably be able to do 12 push-ups or 12 rows pretty right, easily. Right, yeah. But if you do 12 splits, squats are per side, the next day they're gonna be like, coach, can't move, can't sit down, right? And you realize like, all right, split squats belong in the lower end of the spectrum, gotcha, yep. right? Mm -hmm. These upper body exercises maybe are on the higher end of the spectrum. 
Yeah, very good. So let's talk a little bit about the late off season set reps. Let's talk about maybe adding in some more gymnastic stuff. Sure. Yeah. So late off season, um, a lot of the same sort of setup, and Dave will talk about more specific exercise selection here. Um, but what we did is I kind of opened things up a little bit more to be between two and five sets instead of two to three of five to ten reps. Yeah. Right. So what we're trying to do here is one, we're giving a little bit more room for variance between you know your. 12 year old gymnast and your yes. 19 year old gymnast. Yes, exactly. Right? But what we're trying to do is we're slightly increasing the intensity yep. where we can, yep. right? So on exercises like this deadlift or this squat that are gonna have more specific carryover to power development, yep. right? And you can get more loading out of it. Those are the exercises that we're gonna take to the lower end of the rep spectrum and the higher end of the set spectrum. Yes. So your total volume is pretty similar, yep. but you're trying to get it through heavier loading, a few more sets of less reps, they're higher quality, yep. the higher force output as you totally. do it. For the accessory stuff, basically the further you go down this workout, which is why we lay it out this way, the, the less change you're gonna have from that first phase in terms of how many sets or how many reps you're doing. Correct. Right? You're not gonna max out an inverted row <laughs> for like sets of five yeah. with a ton of weight on yeah. it for a gymnast in most right. cases. Exactly. Right? You're still gonna be trying to work on general horizontal pulling strength, building shoulder health, yep. building this endurance that they need for everything else that they do. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think, um, again, as Kiefer said, you're trying to increase the intensity with heavier weight. You need more time and recovery between those right. bouts because they're more challenging, right? But the other piece of this too is that as you start to sprinkle in more gymnastics exercises, those things are challenging and they take a little bit more time. So mm -hmm. again, you're, you're gonna have a denser workout. It's gonna be hard for some of these kids to take some of that. You don't wanna just keep blasting through higher sets, higher reps, and higher weight. It's impossible. Not only does it take an hour and a half, but sure. it's also just exhausting. Yeah. So what we can do here, right? And so again, remember that this is the two days in the fitness gym. We're also having two days that we're kind of more on the gymnastics side, but as season becomes closer and it's preseason, you want to spend more time doing gymnastics. So what I like personally to do is usually shift this down to maybe doing one day in the fitness gym three days with kind of a mixed approach to everything, right? Yep. So maybe in some of these things, we're still gonna keep this basic program design because this is how conceptually we make sure we get everything. But then we start adding in more gymnastic stuff to make it maybe 75, 25, right? Yep. So as we're shifting to power work and the fitness stuff and gymnastics, we're also shifting into more gymnastics stuff because now we're thinking about three skill combinations, half routines are probably coming up now in September and early fall. And we're trying to think about routine stuff and what's going on there. So we might just take some of these exercises that we were doing only two days per week or as drills and start adding them in everywhere, right? So over here, a cast handstand is an overhead press. So we could put that over here, mm -hmm. right? We could take a, a rope climb exercise or something like that, and we could also put that in the vertical pull. We could put that mm -hmm. here, right? The core stuff can clearly all become gymnastic stuff, right? This could be a shape changing exercise, which is super important. You could probably do that both days. Right, you could probably do an arch hollow snap, a hollow arch snap, a handstand snap, a hanging snap. Those are just fundamental for all gymnastics. You could sprinkle in more there. These accessory pieces can become specific to gymnastics. So maybe for men, right, that's gonna be ring strength or for women that's gonna be beam active hip flexibility, that could go on both sides, right? You can see how now we're kind of transitioning this blend. I don't think we should ever drift too far away from the basics of lower body mm -hmm. and squatting and hinging because 90% of gymnastics is jumping and landing, sure. squatting and hinging, right? So I think that you should always keep some degree of that movement pattern. However, this can now become depth jumps. This can become more gymnastic specific rebound, yep. plyometrics over panel mats, things like that. And I think the other thing we haven't touched on yet is one of the reasons it's so important to shift these things later in the season is because by avoiding so much ground contact and pounding, we're pulling off a huge amount of stress and volume on it. They're already tumbling still, they're already doing stuff for skills, but by doing the strength base and then saving some of this power pounding stuff for maybe the later August, we've just chopped out two and a half months of heavy, heavy knee and low back loading, which mm -hmm. is a huge problem in gymnastics. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think hopefully that helps people to kind of wrap up some of these things. Um, we're just going to finish up with a couple of just general concepts for how do we really get this into the ground level. But um, I think that if you can take this, and I'll definitely print this up and make sure it's like a, a downloadable, it's not all scribbled with our handwriting. Um, but if you take this to your staff meeting with your kids and you say, we're going to try something new for the summer, I think that once you get, you know, you work through some of the uphill uh, battles of the first two to three weeks, once you finally get in stride, man, your life is so much easier. It's crazy to think about how much time I wasted just trying to build programs on the fly. I was like, try some pull-ups, let's try some deadlifts. Right. It's crazy. So your stress level is lower. The kids feel like they have a plan, but also when this is in a binder, the kids write their weights down, they write their sets mm -hmm. down, and you can go back and you can look exactly through what they're doing and it's way easier to process. And I think too, when you when you hold the kids accountable for tracking their own stuff, totally. when it comes time for, you know, preseason, you're in season, right? And you're trying to explain, 
like how you can maintain these qualities, right? So yeah. you totally don't totally drop them off, and then next season you have, next off season you have to start fresh. Right. If you can look at the total amount of work they were able to do in the off season, right? When they when this part of their training was at its peak, yeah. It's really easy to say like, all right, we can do sixty percent of this yes. and maintain these qualities, totally. right? Without having that much of an effect on them negatively, not making them that sore, not making them that tired, mm. right? And we can continue this through the season so they stay a little healthier. They still have that foundation. So absolutely, recording things is super super important. And and this does also help as well. This kind of system of binders or tracking helps to make it very specific to the athlete. I mean, let's be real, it's a bell curve, right? You're gonna make a program, you're gonna have 20 athletes who it's perfect, right? You're gonna have 20 athletes, it looks terrible. Like they have weird anatomy, their hips don't move in a certain way. I have some girls who have really uh, externally rotated tibias, they can't squat well. They just do a, a wider squat, or they do mm -hmm. a goblet squat, or a box squat, or they do a step up, right? So you can tweak with those things. But I also think accountability is huge, like you said. Remember as coaches, as strength coaches and gymnastics coaches, it's not our program. We're, we're helping them get better at gymnastics. It's not like we're responsible to chase them around the gym and make sure they do all their weights. So kids that need more because they're advanced, you can look at their bind and be like, all right, we can push it a little bit more. You've been doing the same thing. You can have a harder exercise. But kids that are slacking and are not doing what they're you know, probably capable of, you look and you're like, why has it been the same exact weight for five weeks? Why, yeah. you know, or you skip three days. This is why you're struggling. And so I think it's really important to keep tabs on the kids because, you, again, you're teaching them how to take care of themselves. You're teaching them how to be accountable for their strength and for their gymnastics. That's what we're trying to do here. We're not yeah. trying to be you know, us as like a, a dictator trying to wave the wand around saying you have to do all this stuff. Totally, totally. Cool. All right, guys, so we're gonna wrap it up, right? We've gone through a couple different levels here. We talked about the big concepts for strength and conditioning programming. We talked about program design, but I kinda wanna just end with some of the, the very common questions I get around headaches about implementation, right? Sure. So I'll start off with the first one, then I'm gonna ask Kiefer, because he has a really good idea on this. But for me personally, I think if you don't have a good plan in advance, you're doomed, you're doomed to fail. If you don't really think about, again, what Kiefer said, what do the athletes need? Look back on the season and be like, what did we not do well on? Maybe we did terrible on bars, right? Sure. Maybe we had not enough skills on bars, so we're really gonna focus on upper body strength development. Maybe we fell a lot on uh, you know, floor, like we, kids were just falling left and right. Maybe we need more leg strength. You know, It's gonna be based on what you need, what your gym has for equipment and resources, but also based on you know, what the end goal is for the next year. I think personally, the best thing that you can do once your last meet comes about, whether that's state regionals, nationals, whatever, uh, or elite competitions, sit down with your staff for an hour and a half, buy coffee, get food, and be like, guys, how are we going to approach the physical preparation and cardio programming this year? What are our goals? What are we going to do? And just brainstorm some ideas from here, other resources we have, look new exercises, take some courses, read some books, and be like, let's make a plan for us as a coaching staff for what we think we need to do for the summer. Then talk to the athletes, man. I think that's unfortunately something that never happens is sit down with the athletes and be like, guys, what did you like about the strength program this year? What did you not like about the strength program this year? Um, where do you feel like you're lacking on skills? What can we do to help you? I think fostering that relationship, they're gonna get buy-in and trust and they're gonna be way more involved because they wanna help actually make a program. Yeah. So start with there, have a coaching meeting, have an athlete meeting and then come back around again and build a program together and start there, right? But the other thing I think is super important is about athlete individualization. So how are we gonna make sure that in a group of 20 kids, you know, we make sure that kids are doing what's appropriate for them, but also what fits their anatomy? How do you think we should go about that? I think from, from that perspective, the easiest thing you can do, right? When you start off and we have this list of like, all right, here's our moving patterns that we're trying to hit yes. for a basic strength program, is give yourself a couple options, right? So mm. for a hinge, there's 10 different ways we could do a hinge, Correct. right? There's 10 different ways we could squat, so, right? So if you have an idea of like, all right, what's my one regression, what's my one progression? Mm. How do I modify for this group of kids that, you know, have limited ankle mobility, yes. right? That I know are gonna struggle with this. Totally, yeah. Then you can make sure that everybody's on the same program, but it's just like micro individualized for yep. that person. Absolutely, it's perfect. And I think the other really common example that comes up in gymnastics is maybe overhead shoulder mobility, mm. right? So sometimes kids uh, just weren't blessed with the right parents, you know, right. they didn't pick the lottery, but they're very strong and powerful, but maybe they don't have full overhead elevation. So mm. for them to do, you know, a strict handstand push up, or for them to do a uh, half kneeling dumbbell press is gonna look real weird. They're gonna arch their back, they're gonna press. Sure. So in your mind, you think about, okay, my goal is to do a half kneeling dumbbell press. For kids that are really, really good, maybe we'll make that tempo, maybe we'll add an overhead carry. For kids mm. that are really struggling, let's just landmine press. Let's yep. do an angled handstand push up with a spot. Right, so that, I think the most important reason for that is you don't make kids feel bad. Right? You yep. don't make kids like in the gym and like, oh, I can't do it and I'm always blah, blah, and it's really tough for them. But in your mind, you're just like, okay, no big deal. Uh, you're gonna do this exercise, write it in your binder for this cycle for four to six weeks and it is what it is, you know? And it's just so important to understand that these movements are about building like a quality, 
Yes. Right? We're not trying to make them experts at the skill of doing a kettlebell deadlift. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So if our goal is, all right, I'm trying to build lower body strength and power primarily with the hamstrings and the hips in a hinged position. Yeah. Sick. There's a dozen ways we can do yeah. that. Yeah. Right? And that takes away that worry of like, oh, shoot, this kid can't do this exercise. Yeah. Like, what do I do now? Yeah. It's, there's just so many ways to do, get it done. Absolutely. And last point, and we'll wrap it up just because it's you know, already a lot in people's minds. But the last thing I would say is have a plan, have the meeting, have an athlete meeting, make a plan. Like we're doing this. This is our first block for four weeks. We're going to do it. And then don't be married to it. It's not set in stone. If you get into the gym and it's not working, there's not enough equipment, something's weird, change it, man. Just talk on the fly and discuss because I think the best thing you do is you build a plan and you tinker as you go. Mm -hmm. Don't be like, this is it no matter what you have to do it. And also don't be like kind of just on the fly trying to build it, right? right? There's a marriage there between the two that I think is the best success. And, and I think that what's going to happen is if you have this plan, right, and you have an idea of where you're trying to go with things, mm. when you get to the gym one day and you look on social media and a different gym's doing something else, right, yeah. or your kids haven't gotten to the skill yet, you'll be less likely to get worried and then try to change up the plan totally. on the fly because you know you're getting where you want to go. Yep. You're just doing it on your plan, on your timeline. Absolutely. Yep. And guys, work with a strength coach. I mean, I'm super lucky that I have Kiefer and amazing strength coaches and friends. I wouldn't have all this stuff in my head if I hadn't spent five years learning it, right? So the best money you can spend is having someone come to your gym or you going to a gym once to twice per week. You're going to learn so much. The kids are going to be happy. It gets them out of the monotony of doing gymnastics all the time. But I really think that that's going to be the biggest change we see in gymnastics kind of moving forward. So we'll wrap it up here. But I think what we'll do is we'll let people marinate on this and give them some resources. And maybe when we come closer to the competitive season in the preseason, we'll talk about what do we do in the next few blocks, maybe sure. September, October, November, you know, what's now going to look like when we get ready for routines and stuff like that. Love it. Cool. Thanks, guys. All right.